The Juno World Affairs Council presents Nuclear Risk Reduction in the 21st Century with Sarah Fraser. Fraser is a manager at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, specializing in national security policy, training, stakeholder engagement, and technology integration. Her work explores the policy implications of national security solutions, focusing specifically on the impact emerging technologies have on U.S. government non-proliferation missions. She is also the chairman of the Board of Trustees for the World Affairs Council in Seattle and speaks to us in that capacity. Okay, is this on? We're good, we're good to go. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. Can I, I just have to pause a minute. You all live in probably one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's been such a treat to come here. In fact, when Bruce called me and asked me if I wanted to come here, I got off the phone, went over to my husband, and before I could get the words out, hey, do you want to go to J He had packed his bags, booked his flight, and was standing eagerly by the door ready to join me. So Alaska holds a very special place in my heart and our hearts. We uh, honeymooned here, and so it's just, it's such a pleasure to come here. Um, I'm Sarah Fraser, Chairman of the Board of the World Affairs Council in Seattle, and I have to give a very warm thank you to both Bruce and Carl for their kind invitation to come talk to you today. Um, these guys work really hard. When I joined the board in 2020, this is, I'm right here, um, I got a first-hand look at how hard World Affairs Councils and other nonprofit organizations work to execute their mission during a pandemic. And organizations like ours that rely on this person-to-person -person interaction really had it rough. And we had a very engaged board. We had an outstanding staff, an amazing director. It was still hard, still hard. So I consider it a duty. I consider it an honor and a privilege to come and work with my fellow councils here uh, to help you meet your mission as well. Before I dig into this, uh, I have to give a disclaimer. The views expressed in this presentation are mine and mine alone. They are not necessarily those of my employer or the United States government, okay? So, um, there we go. My plan. My plan was to go through the treaties and agreements and protocols and conventions and really give a detailed discussion of the legal underpinnings of the nuclear risk reduction system. And the lawyers that I manage, they thought that was a great idea. I'm not going to do that to you. Um, I promised both Bruce and Carl that I would make this engaging and accessible and relevant to you. Okay, so what we're actually going to do, excuse me, <clears throat> I want to provide some context for what you see and hear and read about in the news every day. So it's a lot, right? And there's more and more every day. It's overwhelming and it's scary. And what I'm going to argue today is that not every single thing that you see and read about necessarily carries the exact same level of significance, okay? And so I want to give you a mental model, a framework for how to make sense of it all. Mental models are not perfect. I love debating with people mental models. How do we make it better? How do we fix it? Some of you may quibble with it. That's great, I'd love to talk with you. Um, I just want to make this as useful to you as possible. So just a quick show of hands. How many of you follow these issues, these nuclear issues, pretty carefully in the news? I could tell. You had that look about you in the back. Um, how many of you read these things periodically and you think, oh, wait, I really wish I as an individual could do something but what could I do? This is nuclear stuff. This is the world of governments. What could I possibly do? How many of you have had that thought? Everyone? Half of you? Um, I have a slide for you at the end. 
So what I'm going to do, we're going to go through, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the way the system has evolved and grown over time. I'm going to highlight a few things. I'm not going to cover every single nuclear event. That would be intense. We're going to spend a little time talking about what you can do to contribute to nuclear risk reduction. And then we'll end with um, a look at the future. What are those trends and issues and themes and technologies that we might uh, be grappling with moving forward? Okay? As we go through this, um, keep some thoughts in mind. What makes nuclear risk reduction effective? Maybe the better question is, is there a sufficient set of measures that we need to look for? Probably the most important question, though, that I want you to ask yourself through this entire thing is, what can we learn? What can we learn from what we're seeing in the news and how we respond to it? Because we're going to be dealing with these issues. And everything we learn and take away, we can contribute to the next round of negotiations. Before I go to the next slide, I'm going to offer a few definitions, because I'm going to use a lot of jargon. I'm sorry, guys. I can't get away from the jargon. But I'm going to use some terms. So when I refer to nuclear risk reduction, I'm using it in the, in the broadest sense, right? the whole suite of laws and regulations and treaties and programs and technologies, everything that we bring to bear to reduce the nuclear risk. When I talk about non-proliferation, non-proliferation refers to stopping the spread or increase of something. And so in this case, it's nuclear, stopping the spread of nuclear material and nuclear weapons. When I talk about international safeguards, that is a very specific term. International safeguards refers to the system of measures, technology or legal, procedural, that are put in place by countries and the International Atomic Energy Agency to account for and control nuclear material. Why? To provide assurance to all of us, to the international community, that nuclear weapons programs, nuclear programs, not weapons, nuclear programs remain dedicated to peaceful use. International safeguards is a non-proliferation activity. That's my area of expertise, by the way. In my community, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of terms, but we all specialize in one particular area. We've got arms control folks. We've got safeguards folks. and uh, So we all specialize in one of these areas. So international safeguards is, is my area. When I talk about nuclear export control, that's talking about restricting the transfer or trade of sensitive goods and materials and technologies that could be used in a nuclear weapons program. When I talk about nuclear security, nuclear security in, in my world refers to a, a physical set of measures that states put in place to protect their sensitive facilities and materials. We, we like to say those are the gates, guns, and guards. Okay. Arms control is really talking about limiting certain weapons and, and negotiating their use. Okay? Disarmament is talking about the elimination of wholesale categories of weapons. Okay. Now that that is out of the way, and I'm sorry I went for a run in this gorgeous place, and I'm thirsty. I'm going to make a few assertions. I'm going to assert, and these are arguable, okay? I'm going to assert that nearly everything, everything that you see and read and hear about in the news falls under one of these buckets. A lot, I'm going to assert that a lot of what you see and hear falls under this first bucket. Things that test the system, exercise the system in some way. These are the things. They don't keep me up at night. They're concerning, definitely concerning. They're overwhelming, yes. But do I lose sleep over them? Not always, sorry. Um, these could be deliberate, they could be accidental. Cesium-137 source, 
falls outside of regulatory control. Or some state prohibits nuclear inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, from entering a facility. Yeah, gosh, those are concerning. But we, the reason I don't lose sleep is because we have measures. We have laws, we have treaties, we have full programs, we have technologies, regulations, licenses. We have a lot there to respond to these events. That gives me comfort, okay? Fewer number of things fall into this second bucket. Those are things that seek to unravel the system, this fabric of nonproliferation and arms control uh, legal frameworks. These things do keep me up at night. Every time we walk away from a treaty that's been negotiated, oh, that breaks my heart. It takes years sometimes to negotiate these things, and then we walk away from them. So that keeps me up. And then the third category. Again, small number of things. These are things that I call, for lack of a better phrase, breakthrough uh, loopholes. These are activities that states and non-state actors perform that are out of compliance in violation of a given agreement, but they appear like they're complying with the agreement. Oh, man, that really, that really gets to me. The reason those things are so interesting to watch is because the response to those things are usually ones that have the most profound impact and growth on the system. I have a couple of examples that I'm gonna to speak to later on so you'll get, get a sense of what I'm talking about there. So, with that framework in mind, let's go to some early history. This whole thing starts when we drop two atomic bombs on Japan, August 6th, August 9th, 1945, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we saw the world saw unparalleled destruction. Soon thereafter, in the ensuing years, the international community started talking about getting some controls in place. We have to get some, maybe looking at international controls, disarmament, there were resolutions that were passed. The Baruch Plan put forward this notion of putting all materials and facilities under international control, under an international atomic development authority. Well, politics being what they are, didn't, didn't quite take, right? Soviet Union conducts its nuclear test, followed by the British. 1953 rolls around, I'm gonna try again. President Eisenhower gets up and he gives this very famous Adams for Peace speech, the UN. He says, okay, I'm paraphrasing here, by the way. He was much more eloquent, I'm sure. Okay, if you don't want to put everything under international control, why don't we take small portions, small amounts of plutonium and uranium from our existing stockpiles, put that under the stewardship of an international atomic energy agency? I liked this idea. It's an attractive one, right? Because he wants to look at the name of the speech, Adams for speak, he, Speech. He wants to take these awful weapons of destruction and turn them into something that could be good for society, benefit society, and at the same time, reduce existing stockpiles. Oh, didn't take, right? But momentum's growing. In the ensuing years, they start negotiating the mandate for the International Atomic Energy Agency. That gets published and documented in the statute. We see countries around the world starting to talk about regional control. But then we also see France conduct its nuclear test. We see China conduct its nuclear test. And somewhere in there, was the Cuban Missile Crisis, oy vey. Okay, so here we are. We've got, it's about a couple decades after two bombs are dropped, and what do we have? We have five countries that have conducted nuclear tests and really very limited control. 
So we start moving forward. And the first collection of countries in Latin America come together and they form the Treaty of Tlatelolco, 1967. This is the first regional effort to come together and prohibit the possession, transfer, testing, use, acquisition of nuclear weapons in a particular region. Okay, I'm, I'm just for sake of accuracy, there was actually one nuclear weapons free zone before this over the Antarctic, but nobody lives there. <laughs> First meaningful nuclear weapons free zone is Treaty of Tlaté Loco. What's very interesting about this nuclear weapons free zone, there is a legally binding protocol for nuclear weapons states, for the states that had nuclear weapons capabilities at the time, for them to sign, prohibiting them from threatening or using nuclear weapons in the region. All five nuclear weapon states signed that protocol for the Treaty of Tlaté Loco. But you can see this patchwork quilt over the years of regions have come together to create these nuclear weapons free zones. And they each have their legally binding protocol. But in, it wasn't in every single instance that you had a nuclear weapon state sign on to those protocols. And it's because in some cases, in some regions, uh, the parameters or the conditions of the protocol did not align well with the security interests of the nuclear wep weapon state at the time. Regardless, this is great. It's a real step in the right direction, right? Otherwise, you had this rel relatively loose set of controls, if any, on uh, nuclear weapons. So the question here is this effective? Is this regional approach effective? I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and say, hey, these are still around. <laughs> that means something. Is it sufficient? Maybe not, as we see in the next slide. What can we learn from it? These are still around. What is it about this, this type of response that's useful and effective and sustainable? As long as you're asking questions like that, you're thinking about how to evaluate these things that you're going to read in the news. Every time there's an event and we respond to it, hey, is that response going to be effective? Is that response going to have the features that have worked well in the past? Or are we dealing with something completely different? If you feel empowered to evaluate some of those things, that means this talk was successful. Okay. Okay, my favorite is the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT. It's the cornerstone of the non-proliferation nuclear risk reduction system today. Cornerstone. You have to know three things about the NPT. It sought to freeze the nuclear landscape. Right? We already have five countries that had conducted nuclear tests. We don't need any more. The rest were considered non-nuclear weapon states. Okay, so it sought to froze, freeze the landscape. Second thing, so there was a grand bargain involved, and I'm going to talk about the terms of the treaty. A grand bargain, meaning a set of measures that were acceptable enough to lead to an enduring compromise, one that is still around today, that means something. Okay. And the third thing is that there is a very rigorous verification program, which I love. And I will talk about quite a bit more in, in later slides. Let's just talk about the terms of the treaty. Article 1 says that nuclear weapon states agree not to provide nuclear weapons to non-nuclear weapon states or the ability to produce, uh, acquire or produce them. Excuse me. Article 2 says that non-nuclear weapon states agree not to seek them or seek the ability to produce or acquire them. Article 3 says that non-nuclear weapon state signatories agree to place all their nuclear materials and facilities in their borders under safeguards. As a reminder, international safeguards 
It's a system of measures that are put in place by countries under agreement with the IAEA to provide assurance that those nuclear programs remain, remain dedicated to peaceful use. Article 3 effectively says none, we all agree to a verification program. Article 4 recognizes the inalienable right to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. That's that nugget for the Atoms for Peace speech. There's a lot of good that can come from nuclear energy, not just bad. And we have an inalienable right to pursue that. Article 6 calls on nuclear weapon states to disarm, take steps toward disarmament. Nuclear weapon states have a record of doing just that. They have demonstrated measurable reductions in their arsenals over time under verified agreement. So let's talk about the verification system. Under, this ver under Article 3, Article 3 calls on states to sign an agreement, a safeguards agreement with the IAEA. There are hundreds of these agreements in place. These agreements state what states and the IAEA can do to implement the terms of this treaty. And it spells it out in great detail. It talks about how inspections are going to be conducted, on what schedule, at what cadence, what type of information is going to get collected, how is it going to get collected, how is it going to get reported, what, can, what does the state have to do to fulfill administrative measures in order to facilitate inspections. All of this is spelled out in great detail in safeguards agreements and associated agreements. These agreements are then implemented in ways that are objective, effective, efficient, and non-discriminatory. The agency works very, very hard, IAEA works very, very hard to provide, to be that independent, objective verification body and not get entangled in too many politics. It's a challenge, regardless. This is a robust, reliable, and technically sound verification program. Why is the NPT successful? Why is it still here? It's not a perfect agreement. People have a lot of beef with it. Um, but it's here. It's still here. Why? Is it, is it one factor? Is it the fact that it's based on this enduring compromise? Is it the verification program? What is it? What's the secret? What can we learn from that? What can we take from that and apply to future agreements? All right, so this is talking about Kind of the origins of the system that we have today. And now let's talk about that third bucket of activities, the things that can really lead to uh, real dramatic changes. Okay. For the type of things that we're going to talk about here, the slide is kind of boring, but. <laughs> I'm going to give you two examples from history of breakthrough events acts where the actors appeared to be in compliance, but they managed to do something we didn't want them to do. 1974, India conducts a nuclear test. And at this point, you might say, well, come on, Sarah, we have five nuclear tests. What are you making a big fuss about? Because India was able to conduct that test using material that it obtained from a research reactor that was provided to it from, by Canada in the 1960s. Canada provided that technology, that reactor, in good faith. It was supposed to be used for peaceful purpose. And what do they do? <laughs> well, very quickly, a collection of nuclear supplier states came together and said no. <laughs> We want to facilitate nuclear trade. That's very important to us. But we need to do it in ways that are where we have some assurance that the technology that we provide others is not going to be misused in some way. The Nuclear Suppliers Group is a very powerful multilateral export control regime. It's 
not necessarily a treaty, we were, we, we're used to seeing with the MPT, but it's a collection, a collection of willing parties who come together, work together to impose a certain set of controls. That's really powerful, right? What can we learn from that? Does it always have to be a treaty or an agreement to be an effective control? Maybe not. Fast forward to the 1990s when the international community, IAEA, discovered clandestine activities and facilities in DPRK, and, sorry, uh, North Korea and Iraq. Countries that were NPT signatories and implementing safeguards agreements. They were reporting information on their nuclear materials, inventories, and facilities to the IAEA. The IAEA was visiting and conducting inspections at declared facilities. And right next door, they were building clandestine facilities that could be used, misused for a nuclear weapons program. That's like, here's an analogy. If any of you have kids, how many of you have told your kids, go clean your room, I'm gonna come inspect it in 10 minutes, right? So you hear a lot of activity. And you go in there and the room is pristine. And you're sitting there like, where did the Legos go? Where did the lightsaber go? Where did that slingshot go? Where did it all go? You're like, where'd it go? I cleaned it, mama. You cleaned it, okay. Good, what if I walk down the hallway? Did you put all that stuff in the hallway? You walk down and you open that door and everything falls out on the ground like, ah! That's essentially what's happening here, right? So the, I, the international community comes out, embarks on a multi-year program to strengthen existing measures to detect diversion of material, existing authorities had already had to do that work. And it also introduced a new legal agreement called the Additional Protocol. This is a voluntary agreement that states can sign and the United States US policy is to encourage universal acceptance of the Additional Protocol in addition to their standard safeguards agreement. This agreement calls on states to increase the amount of information it's providing on nuclear fuel cycle activities and provides greater access to facilities. So now the IAEA can include that closet down the hallway as part of its verification regime. As a result, in countries that have both a comprehensive safeguards agreement in force and an additional protocol, the IAEA has great, good, almost complete situational awareness of what's going on in that country and can provide assurance that nuclear material is not being diverted and there's no undeclared processing of material in the country. Now, what this is showing is that these, as the regime grows, as we respond to these events, they start to work together. NSG, nuclear suppliers, required the, uh, often required that the recipients of technology have to accept the additional protocol. And the additional protocol has export and import reporting obligations start to reinforce each other. Let's talk about verification. Verification is really important because you will notice that a lot of agreements, a lot of treaties that don't get accepted or take a long time to work through Congress, it's often because there are questions around the efficacy of their verification program. Verification is what provides assurance that signatories are compliant with the treaty. So this is what it looks like here. How many of you think that nuclear material is only found in nuclear fuel cycle facilities like a nuclear power plant or a research reactor? I think those are the only places where nuclear material is found in a country. It's not. Nuclear material, as defined by the IAEA, uranium, plutonium, and thorium, can be found in hospitals, right? In teletherapy units, cancer units, oil and gas, installation industry, in the in construction, military, in uh, military aviation, 
Uranium metal, it's really heavy, dense, right? So it's used for shielding and counterweights as well. So a large part of what the IAEA does is work with countries, even those that have no nuclear plans, no nuclear facilities, no research reactors, to put together an inventory of their nuclear material in their country that needs to be reported. So verification starts with the reporting of information about nuclear material inventories and the reporting of information about facility design. So if a country is going to build a new facility, they need to start reporting on the design of that facility from the very beginning and the IAEA performs what's called design information verification, physical visits to those facilities throughout the life cycle of that facility to confirm that it is operating as declared. The IAEA conducts inspections at facilities, at locations outside facilities. They compare what the information that was provided by the state. This is where I said the nuclear material was going to be, and then they go in and say, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's where it is. They take measurements. They make observations. They talk to facility staff. They compare the book inventory, and they're able to provide assurance that the declared information is accurate. No material has been diverted. The IAEA installs what's called containment and surveillance measures. These are cameras, containers with seals that are used to detect movement of nuclear material by unauthorized actors. They take samples, environmental samples. They'll go into a facility and they'll take a sample and they'll perform analysis on that sample. And they, that is one of the most powerful tools, technical tools that the agency has today to detect undeclared processing of nuclear material. So if you go into that closet down the hallway or storage facility and the reporting says that there's no processing, no storage, anything that's related to nuclear is supposed to be going on in that location and they can do a swipe sample and they find isotopes of uranium on there, they're going to go, uh, what's going on here? Environmental sampling was part of the suite of measures that were used to increase, strengthen the agency's verification measures after the uh, discovery in Iraq. The, I, the IAEA also performs a number of things at headquarters in Vienna. They review state declarations as we've talked about. They look at third party research, I'm sorry, open source research and provi information provided by third parties, other states. Verify that the information is accurate and complete. They look at commercial satellite imagery to detect construction activities going on in the state. They pull data from remote monitoring systems that are installed at facilities, actually large facilities and they get real-time data on the state of health of those facilities. So why am I telling you all this? Part of this is simply to give you a lot of, of reassurance and confidence that we have a very rigorous system in place to detect efforts at the state level to, to misuse or divert or process new material for a clandestine nuclear program. This is very encouraging to me. This is a great example of an effective verification regime. Nuclear security is that third pillar that you saw on a previous slide. Nuclear, so international safeguards and the IAEA, they're really focused on making sure that states are compliant with their safeguards obligation. It's the state they're worrying about. But the state has responsibilities too. The state needs to make sure that they are taking responsibility for the protection of their nuclear facilities, their nuclear material, making sure they put the right laws and regulations and license controls in place for any material moving through the country, crossing borders, being used or processed or stored 
in locations around the country. That's a state responsibility. And a lot of these measures that are put in place for nuclear security and nuclear safeguards purposes, they can overlap and complement each other. But, some of the, but the purpose is often distinct too. Okay, we're gonna shift now, getting towards the end. Do you remember that slide at the beginning, that long, long tapestry of treaties and agreements? Okay, here's our nuclear arms control landscape today. We have the NPT and we have nuclear weapons free zones. Many of the treaties that were in force in the last couple of decades have been, many countries have withdrawn They've been suspended, they've been superseded by others. I'm gonna come back to New Start. You've probably read about New Start. We'll talk about that in just a sec. So we don't really have those anymore. And then we have a few, a few treaties that are on the table for negotiation. And they're not, they're not totally enforced yet. We've got the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which the United States has signed but not ratified, Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. That sounds a lot like the NPT, doesn't it? It's a different treaty. That's much more focused on disarmament as opposed to freezing that nuclear landscape. They're, they're different. They have different terms and different political issues that are, that are entangled in them. But they're not totally on the books yet. We've got the NPT and nuclear weapons free zones as our primary anchors. We got a lot of work to do. But remember, remember what's behind everything that's in place there. Remember all those verification measures. Remember all those agreements, those hundreds of agreements, laws, regulations, licenses. That's all there too. So that should give you some comfort, but we still have a ways to go. New start. I don't want to forget that. Um, you may have heard New START is having some problems. Last year, Russia halted inspections under New START. This is after it had been renegotiated. They stopped attending bilateral, bilateral consultative committee discussions. So the, these were biennial, biannual? meetings, they met twice a year to talk. They're not attending those anymore. Stop providing notifications on changes to its arsenal. Um, and then just this year, they announced their intent to suspend their involvement in the treaty. Okay, apply the mental model to this. Is he poking? Is he testing the system? Or is that collection of activities actually unraveling the fabric, weakening the fabric? So everything that we're watching associated with New Start, that's a concern. Along with everything else that we're seeing, it's a concern. All right, what can you do? I asked some colleagues who work specifically on this issue, hey, what, what would you tell someone who wanted to do something Nuclear Weapons Info, that's, that sounds very provocative, but it's actually, it's a great website. Put together, they have a ton of information on things that you can do. You can read through that list there, but I'm, I'm actually gonna highlight four things that I think are really great for you to do to feel like you can contribute to nuclear risk reduction. Learn, educate yourself. Follow things in the news very carefully. You're coming to this talk to learn. The more you learn about these agreements, the, learn you, the more you understand why they succeed, why they don't make it through Congress, why they might be politically challenging to implement. The more you can evaluate legislation, the more you can engage more effectively with your legislators so that you can start communicating to them, hey, why aren't you, why aren't you supporting this? Why are you supporting this? Arm yourself with information. It's the most effective thing you can do. Donate. Here's the thing. The NGO community that is focused on climate change, oh my God, they have a ton of money. The NGO community working on nonproliferation arms control, drop in the bucket. Donate. Support your local 
nonproliferation nonprofit. They work so hard and they're so passionate. A lot of friends in that community. Divest. You can make sure that your investments, your personal investments, are not being used in ways that you don't want them to be used. Know where your investments are going. A lot of, com a lot of companies that, and this, I think this is actually talked about on the Nuclear Weapons Info website. A lot of companies that make a lot of uh, conventional armaments, small part of their portfolio is dedicated to nuclear. And a lot, if a lot of their investors came forward and said, hey, we don't like this part of your business, they may actually listen. Vote. Be active on these issues. Don't be apathetic. Your legislators need to hear from you. And get creative. Art and music and other creative activity is a great way to draw attention to these issues. I took part in a nonprofit uh, funded activity that looked at how we use a lot of these creative solutions to draw attention to nuclear risk reduction so that we can communicate more effectively with the public on these issues and get them to think and understand more about what's going on and how to support our more effective legislation. You can also, my kids hate this, but you can talk to your kids about nonproliferation and arms control. Sometimes it just starts with basic conflict resolution on the playing field, on the playground. There are things you can do, you're not powerless, is my point. Okay, last slide, and then I think we're pretty good. Let's talk about the future, apply that mental model to the future. So far, we've, take, we've looked at micro-level activities, right? But flip it. Let's, now let's look at the macro level. Climate change. Climate change is going to have an impact on our nuclear risk reduction system. Why? Because if we want to meet our climate goals by 2030, by 2050, doesn't it make sense that nuclear power is going to be part of that solution? with more nuclear power plants being part of renewable energy portfolios, we're gonna see an increase in nuclear material, increased burden on the IAEA. Climate security is a growing issue. Uh, people are really starting to think very carefully about how do we balance these competing demands of meeting our global climate goals while managing the proliferation risk that goes with it. I would argue, looking at the mental model, climate change is going to exercise our system. It's going to put it through its paces. And I'm fascinated to see what happens with it. Space, the next frontier, cybersecurity, two domains that intersect with nuclear. If we want to do prolonged space travel, nuclear, nuclear powered vehicles are gonna be part of that solution. We're gonna have nuclear material in space. Does that mean we're gonna send IA, I love this image, IAEA inspectors up into space and they're gonna be there with their clipboards? Like, no. Verification is gonna look really different. We're trying to figure that out right now. The rules of the road in space and in cyber when they intersect with, cyber, with nuclear, a lot of those roads are being, rules of the road are being written right now. So is it an unraveling? Maybe not, but it's a creation of a fabric that's going to be fascinating to watch. And this is why I kept saying, look at what we've done in the past. Can you learn from it? Can you apply it? Or do we have something that is completely different from what we had in the past? It may be we have something completely different, but there may be pieces of it that are exactly the same. Don't re don't reinvent the wheel. And then last but not least, emerging and enabling technologies. There is a lot coming out of the commercial industry. Advanced sensors, materials, distributed technology, blockchain, 3D, uh, 3D printing, additive manufacturing. Which of these technologies, which of these enabling technologies 
deep learning, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Which of these technologies are going to enable the next proliferator to violate an agreement while looking as if they're complying? Which one? <sighs> that's job security right there. It's trying to figure out the answer to that question. So that's the future. But it's not hopeless. As long as people, good people like you are engaging and learning and applying these lessons to future solutions, talking to your legislators, being thoughtful about the things that you support, we'll get there. We've built up a lot, and now we got to hold on to it. So that's it. Thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for being attentive. So I'm happy to take questions, but if you ask hard questions, then I'm going to pretend I can't hear you because my bandwidth went out and internet dropped, and oh, I'm so sorry. I missed that. I'm kidding. Questions? Uh, hopefully an easy one. Are there concerns about miniaturized mobile reactors like the ones that they keep talking about putting in the Arctic? Are those easier to steal or do nefarious things with, or is it just another example of a good use? Um, and you, did you say mid-rise? Sorry, mobile miniaturized re mobile reactors. Oh, mobile reactors. Oh, mobile reactors. Mobile reactors are fascinating. I have a team of people that are, um, I know of a team of people that are working on the safeguards, issues, and challenges associated with mobile reactors. A lot of work is going into ensuring that the design of these reactors have safeguards baked in. It's, it's a domain called safeguards by design. So a lot of these new reactors are being designed in such a way to make them easier to safeguard and account for the nuclear material. But there are still a ton of questions around legal authorities, who, who's responsible for reporting when, when it's moving. Right? There are a lot of questions like that. It's a great question. Um, we are getting smarter every day about how to better control uh, mobile, uh, mobile reactors but we're still untangling a lot of questions. I don't lose sleep over them, though. Hi. Um, getting back to your mental model about items that are potentially unraveling. So recently, China has started increasing the number of nuclear warheads it has, looking on quadrupling them in the next decade or so. How does that come? match up with uh, the last several decades of basically US, Soviet Union, Russia, detente. OK, that was a hard I'm sorry, the <laughs> bandwidth went out completely. Um, so you're concerned about, so what is the, the well, practical do you, do you, question? Do you see the increase in nuclear weapons in China as a un potential unraveling? to use your mental model. Ah, a potential unraveling. It's the increase in nuclear weapons in China, a potential unraveling of the regime. That's a really, that's a really good question. I guess, I don't know. Um, Is it going to, I think what you're asking about, is it going to, for any type of, of rapid growth like that, is it going to be too much for the current regime? Also, is it going from a two, <coughs> so also going from like a, a two nation hegemony of nuclear weapons to a three, three body problem? You do, you do follow these issues in the news a lot. I'm, I'm going to say that, A, it's premature to know for sure how that's going to play out. So I don't know because I don't know. It hasn't happened yet. However, what I would look at is uh, a lot of what we've put in place. We have a lot of experience. And I went over a lot of them in the talk today. We have a lot of experience coming together collectively in groups, in like-minded groups. We have a lot of experience negotiating 
new treaties, new agreements. We're going to apply all of that to this new context. Um, some of it's going to work. Are there going to be breakthrough moments? Possibly. I, I don't know yet. I think, I think the mental model still holds, but that may be something that we could talk about. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. If you think, if you think that the mental model breaks, we should go out for a coffee <laughs> and, and talk about that at length. I like your question, though. It's a very thoughtful question. It's a very thoughtful question. I've been, I've been reading uh, analysis on the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine that there's a potential for Russia to slip into a failed state if their government falls apart. And are there adequate treaties and safeguards in place that could handle that uh, the issue of nuclear weapons, nuclear materials that are currently under the control of the Russian government. I hire a bunch of lawyers who would love to answer that question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question either. I would, I would say for sure that the suite of a group, what we have under the NPT now is we rely first and foremost on comprehensive safeguards agreements, which is the type of agreement non-nuclear weapon states would sign. We rely on voluntary offer agreements, which is the agreement that nuclear weapon states sign. It's a, it's a different type of agreement. And then there's a different type of safeguards agreement called item specific safeguards. And we've done, there's been a bit of study on what happens when you, when the basic terms of the agreement start to go away, what, what can you fall back on? And you, what I would probably argue is that you might fall back on item specific safeguards, but I know there would be a concerted effort to work between the IAEA and Russia to apply safeguards and maintain continuity, what's called continuity of knowledge over the material in countries so that we can maintain as much control as possible. Um, there are any number of variables or scenarios that could happen from that, which is why I, I always kind of hedge and say, I'm not quite sure because we haven't seen that yet, but that's what would happen. The IAEA would get on the ground pretty quickly and they would start talking to them about what legal measures are in place that would give them authority to come in and place safeguard, place those, that material under safeguards. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. And we'll call it there for time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. That was Sarah Fraser in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation produced in collaboration with KTOO. It was recorded April 20th, 2023 at KTOO in Juneau with major support from Core Alaska Kensington Mine and the University of Alaska Southeast and with additional support from AELMP, Hayton Associates, Ramada by Wyndham, Sea Alaska, and Wosman and Associates.